I am Vinny Tonerich. Folks, your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed. It's the Friday show. You know what that means. We bring in someone with way more knowledge than me. And this woman will delight. I'm sure you're going to love her. When I think about this woman, I think about people like uh, Diana Nyad, uh, uh, Renala uh, Klumska is the way her name is pronounced, uh, Amelia Earhart, and this woman, none other than Caroline Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Do you recognize any of those names, Caroline? I recognize two out of the three. I didn't recognize Renee. Renata? Renata. Renata. I'll, I'll tell you who she is. She had a boyfriend back in the 90s. He wrote a book after he climbed uh, Mount Everest. Uh, his name was Joran Krop. If you ever want, it, the book is no longer uh, in print, but if you can find a copy of Ultimate High. Okay. I will loan you my copy. Okay. But he signed it, and I'm I read books anyway. I, sweat, I cry over them. I they sit, so I sweat on them. I bleed on my books. Yeah, you don't need yeah. to check mark. Yeah. yeah, you need to get this book. Uh, after reading your book, the book I just read, uh, you have to read his book. Now I'll tell you what he did. He climbed Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. No big deal. Right, that's that's happened before. I mean, most of the Sherpas run up and down that mountain, uh, no no oxygen needed. Um, but he did it the the way he did it was he rode his bike from his house in Sweden, six thousand miles, and carried everything he was going to take up the mountain. I do know him actually. I do know the story. Yeah. Now now story. now I know. Yeah. I knew you would know the story. Yeah. Right. He gets to the top. Well, he he fails. He fails. He comes back down to base camp. And then it was 1996, the deadliest day on Everest, May 10th. Remember that? Oh, Rob yeah. Hall, uh, Scott Fisher, Sandy Hill Pittman, that whole thing happened. Yasuka Namba, the guy from Texas, can't remember his name. Dave Brashears. Uh, well, Brashears was up there doing the IMAX film. Mm -hmm. And by the way, did you know Dave Brashears just died? Yes, I did. Sad. He was a he was a hero of mine, actually. <laughs> Same here. I knew. Look, you and I have a lot of heroes in common, and I'm in love with you. I read one, folks. I read one of her books, and I fell in love with this woman. It's it's as simple as that. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But Urine Crop was the guy who was trying to get Rob Hall to stand up and start walking off of that mountain again mm -hmm. after he had to, you know, he had to leave Doug behind, but he never got up because the only person who went up before the 10th was Urine Crop. And then he went up again after the deadly day and got to the top, brought a bunch of bottles down with him, oxygen bottles. He was trying to clean the mountain on the way down, packed up all of his stuff and rode back to Sweden. By the way, he used zero Sherpas to do the whole trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A couple of years later, after we met, he died. Avalanche, as most of them die in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but his, uh, his girlfriend, Renata Shlumska, kept carrying on some of the things that he wanted to do. And she's a woman like you, where mm -hmm. she's just doing it. She's out there. So when I when I started reading this book, I went, Renata, Diana Nyad, you know, Amelia Earhart. I mean, everyone knows who she is. Everyone our generation knows who she is, right? And now you. You fall into that category. No, no, I don't. But 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 thank you. I just no, no, but thank you. Listen, I you, you <laughs> You're doing things that everyone needs to know about. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I saw your TED Talk. And uh, you did something that I tried several times as a kid. We grew up, we're the same age. I'm 61. You're a little younger than me. I'm 60. 
Yeah. We grew up with the Guinness Book of World Records, and every kid did the same thing. Which Turn to the page with the person with the longest fingernails. Bing! That and the fattest twins, and they were on the, you know, they showed them riding away on little Honda mini bikes, that kind of thing. The tallest man in the world. Yeah. The biggest man in the world. But I read page for page trying to find one record that I could break. And you did the same thing. Oh, yeah. Right? Let's talk about that. <laughs> talk about oh, what yeah. you tried to do. Well, I knew I had no skill and I wasn't the tallest or the longest fingernailed. Um, and so I figured I would try something that demanded no skill at all, which was crawling. Cause we all do that as a kid. And I enlisted a friend and we didn't train because I figured we knew how to crawl and we just got furniture pads. I mean, this was 19, uh, 80, uh, two. No, okay, no, so no, you no. have to be 20, yeah. 20 no, no, no. no, excuse me. Uh, no, I was um, 14. So, uh, oh, wait, was, you couldn't, in 1982, you couldn't be 14. Okay, so I, I graduated. Oh, right. That's true. Okay, so it was 1970s. It was 77 or something. It's like okay, ridiculous. better. Something like that. Yeah. And, I was born in 63. Someone else do the math. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and you, you basically, the only way, that you knew you, you sort of wrote into the Guinness Book of World Records. They wrote you back and told you what you needed and you needed to have media and you needed to have witnesses. And so we set off crawling around a high school track and there <laughs> exists media to this day, a photo of me and my friend crawling with these big furniture pads. Yeah. The, the record at the time was 11 and a half miles or 11 miles, something like that. And, uh, Sadly, I only went eight and a half miles. Okay, what stopped? What made you stop? Well, it was 12 hours in. My friend had dropped out at about mile five, and it was dark. It was raining, and I was I was bleeding. My knees were bleeding. We had no sense of strategy, so we, I had put the furniture pads over my jeans. That was a really bad call. Yeah. And then uh, I, my knees were just completely um, filleted, and uh, I, I was kind of hallucinating and the uh, witness who was an adult pulled, said, you know what time we're stopping. And I was in no shape to say yes or no inside. I was glad. Um, but I was also sad. I couldn't remember why I'd wanted to do this in the first place, which often happens when you're doing something really hard. Yeah. Uh, and I've, that was a big lesson for me that you do not judge yourself based on how you're feeling in that moment. You try to remember who you were when you decided to do this. But anyway, I don't view it as a failure now, but I sure did then. Uh, I was sad. And uh, but here's the funny part, Vinny. So Go it was on. not just me that loved. Yeah, here's here. And it gets funnier. Wait, hang on. <laughs> no, really. Uh, so my identical twin, who you happen to know, yeah. um, also was obsessed with the Guinness Book of World Records. And we were also both wanted to do this, but here I was, I attempted it on my own and of course failed, but guess what? She later in life made the Guinness book of world records because oh, she, I, I didn't know that. What yeah. is she? Well, she was an actress on the most watched show in the world, Baywatch. So th the seasons she was on was when Baywatch hit the record. So she's in the Guinness book of world records. And I can tell you, she holds that over. Uh, she holds that over me. She should, because by, yeah. by the way, it's funny because I, um, your sister convinced me I hadn't, when I got to LA, your sister convinced me to be a model and I was 29 years old. And I said, well, Alexandra, and folks, everyone, her sister is Alexandra Paul, the one with no boobs on Baywatch, as she's commonly known. The um, smart, the smart athletic one. The smart one Very with the pretty. short hair. Yeah. Um, I, I thought your sister was one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. And by extension, you fall into that category. So folks, you might want to go watch this on YouTube if you want to see a really beautiful woman. Your, your sister convinced me to be a model like about a year before that. And I was like, well, I'm not skinny. I can't. And she goes, no, 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 it's LA. You have abs. You can do this. They, they want guys like you in beer commercials and whatnot. And I find I, I found myself in one infomercial after another. I was just 
in that infomercial thing. Anytime they were selling some kind of abdominal thing, I got the call. And one day I got the call for Baywatch. And I was like, wait, I can't act. I'm not an actor. And they said, no, you don't have to act. The problem they had when Baywatch first came in, now, Alexandra wasn't on yet when I was on. They had just brought it back. It was bought by a different company. And they said, look, the actors don't have great abs, meaning uh, Hasselhoff was kind of smooth. So they said they had me and another guy. They had two or three guys with some hair on our chest. They trimmed it down. And we were on what they called second unit. And they took us out and said, all right, now you're going to run and you know dive into the water with the little orange deal. Okay, now you're going to run in that direction, run off of the ramp like you're going towards the water. They used us to be the people where you never saw our faces. You would see someone else's faces, and then we would run into the shot. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> you were and an ab double? Pr pretty much. Yeah, we were just like body doubles, right? And then at one point, I was still like, whenever I couldn't get any other work, I would go do that because it would give us four, five hundred, six hundred bucks a day just to do that. One day, your sister showed up, and it's like, here we are again, right? It's like everywhere along the way, she got into triathlons. We would run into each other. She met her husband through that, I think, through yeah. triathlon. It, we just kept meeting up in LA, right? It, like everything just kept bringing us together. Uh, I, I learned never go to Thanksgiving with a vegan because of your sister. She invited me to Thanksgiving. There is no turkey. Never occurred to me. Well, definitely <laughs> don't go to a Thanksgiving dinner if she's cooking. But there's some really good vegan cooks. It just happens not to be the Paul twins. You, you know what? She, wherever we went, we went to some guy's house or somewhere. It was delicious. Hmm. It was delicious, but there was no turkey. There was no kind of, well, I think there was turkey stuffing, but there was nothing turkey-ish about it. But there was, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, was there, it was Thanksgiving without a turkey. And I went, okay, tofurkey is not my friend. I learned that from your sister. Um, so wait, we got on to your sister because we were talking about something else. The world record. She's a world record holder and I am not. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> if I'm a world record holder now because I was on that show for five minutes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, maybe maybe I got that over you. Would you ever consider being who you are and proving that women can do shit? Would you ever go back and try that record again? Well, the last time I looked, which was, I think when I did the TED Talk was in 20, so it's probably just 100 miles now, but it was 32 at the time. So the answer is no. And I'll tell you why, Vinny, because I'm older now and I don't actually, when I was young, I think those metrics were important to me to be yeah. the first, you know, to be the fastest, to be the only. And those are no longer important to me. And in fact, it's kind of liberating because I enjoy things so much more. You and I was often the first. That's the thing. I mean, not off, not because I'm in any way um, talented, but I had this I had this idea that if I just got into spaces where there weren't that many people, and that I could be the reliable teammate in a situation. So, for instance, I was a member of an all women's whitewater rafting team that went around the world doing first ascents. Wow. I was in no way an ex real experienced whitewater rafter, but I was reliable and I was strong and I was brave. So I was a good teammate. And, uh, but it, you know, and so I just, and you know, back then too, I was one of the first to mountain bike through Bolivia, but that was only because mountain bikes were new. It was the eighties yeah. and no one had just done it. It wasn't that I was special. So that, that stuff is really no longer important to me. And uh, so, no, I would not try a record again. And also, I read about the Bolivian thing in your, uh, in your book, the book we're, we're talking about today, uh, Tough Broad, folks. Uh, by the way, it's, it's already going to be in the Vinny Book Club, so you guys can go straight there because I've already read it. Sometimes I have to wait because I read them later. Uh, and we're going to get into Tough Broad. But th there are other things, Caroline. One of the first women to be a firefighter in San Francisco. And not just any firefighter. I mean, you mentioned in Tough Broad, you were diving for, you know, looking for guns that were tossed in water and maybe bodies and everything else. 
what was that like? And did you, I think in a book, you said you never came across a body while you were diving, but what, what's that like being in that second unit and, and dealing with trying to save people? I was on the rescue squad. Um, and the rescue squad is a specialized unit. We do the rescues and fires. We go in without hose. We just go for rescue. And right. we also do all the other technical rescues like scuba. We did scuba searches. We did surf rescues. We did cliff rescues. So we were the kind of the Batman and it was exhilarating. I loved it. I was, um, it, you had to take extra classes and you had to do very weird things. And you got, you were sent out on all the crazy calls and it was uh, fantastic. I really love being a firefighter. It fit me very well. And I was not the first, I was the 15th. I, I think that's important because I think the first five, they trod this path when you walk in somewhere that right. I, but you know, I was the 15th and there was 1500 men. So there was definitely, I was a tiny, tiny, you know, I was in the very beginning. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, really incredible people, men and women, brave, honorable. I learned a lot about myself. What makes you choose something like that? I mean, you know, look, I know your sister is into all kinds of crazy stuff. She would swim around the world if she could. <laughs> I know you have a brother who will do anything to save an animal because your sister used to tell me about this stuff. What happened in your childhood <laughs> to make you guys do this and do what you do? Um, you know, my parents were not outdoorsy people and they weren't in any way, they were very conservative in terms of lifestyle. They were just, you know, quote, they lived a very um, normal, quote, normal lifestyle. I don't know. I think that maybe um, we, we, we were very privileged. We grew up very privileged. So we had a lot of opportunities. Our parents, you know, wanted us to experience a lot of different things. But again, so that we went biking or they put us on bikes, they put us on sleds. But I think for me, the biggest reason, and maybe I can speak for my sister, is that I'm an identical twin. And so we were at once competitive, but we didn't really want to be better than the other, but the world wanted us to sort of go head to head. And there was a lot of comparison also from the world and also internally, I think, from, from each of us. And, uh, and so we were, I personally, I can speak for myself, was constantly striving to live up to my sister, who is amazing in all these ways, smart, full of integrity, you know, really um, has an iron will. Yeah. Do you think that she feels the same way about you trying to live up to you? I mean, she says that, but you know, she's super nice too. So. Well, well, but we know that, but there is that thing where, you know, she, you're trying to live up to her, but then she's there. She is who she is. And she's looking at you. I mean, the first thing she told me when we met, we had known each other for five minutes and she could not brag. And she goes, you know, I have an identical twin. I was like, Oh, does she act too? And she goes, no, she's a firefighter. And she starts talking about this badass sister of hers. That, yeah. That's all I knew about. I knew that she had an identical twin that was a firefighter. So obviously this woman was very proud of you, right? So she had to look up to you in some way, shape or form, right? <laughs> you know, the irony is that I was a, she belonged, a lifeguards in LA, technically the real life lifeguards are part of the fire department. So we were both in the fire department at the same time. She was playing one on TV and I was one in real life, which maybe is how identical twins do it. But uh, yeah, so we, we um, I think it's, I think being an identical twin, you just always have this gauge next to you, like who you could be, the possibility. And you, you and also want to impress her of all the people in the world. She's the person I want to impress the most. I had a younger brother. Um, I, I, I was lucky enough to, I played D1 college football. Hard to tell now that I was ever an athlete, but I had a younger brother who was maybe eight years younger than me. So he was really young when I was playing college ball, but he saw what was going on. And he, he got into athletics at a very young age. And we decided to lie to him all along the way. Um, so I remember he asked my younger brother one time, he goes, Hey, um, I can, I, he goes, I can touch the rim. You know, it was a big deal in basketball. I, I, he was in eighth grade. He goes, I can touch the rim. And my brother lied to him and said, yeah, by the time Vinny was in eighth grade, he was able to dunk, <laughs> which is not true. I wasn't able to dunk until maybe the end of my freshman year, mm. but he he didn't have these lines of limitation, right? 
he was told, oh, wait, this can be done. So what do you think he was doing within six months in the eighth grade? That's great. Dunking a basketball. That's really interesting. You know, how many tackles did was the most tackles that he made in any game? We would lie and say 18, 20. Now, if you sat back and did the math, there's not that many offensive plays that go off in a football game in high school for one guy to have that many tackles, right? Lines of limitation. The guy just became this phenom because he had no lines of limitation. I thought about that when I was reading your book, Tough Broad, because you're talking about women and you you feel as though, and I agree with you, that women are told they can't do things. This line of limitation is set up, and it seems like it's your journey to try to break those lines of limitation and have women do more. Am I wrong about that, or where are you on that? Yeah, you're 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 a little you're a little right. Um, so let me. I'll just say that for people who don't know that the book is called Tough Broad: From Boogie Boarding to Wing Walking: How Outdoor Adventure Improves Our Lives as We Age. There it, there is. it is. Yeah. And um, it's about. It's basically what I started to think about when I was fifty-five, and I was on my surfboard and looking around. There was no women my age out in this sort of sloppy big winter swell, and I wasn't a good surfer. I knew there were a lot of women who were better than me, but the conditions would be you know, baby big and tough. And they weren't, but there were a lot of men out there my age and older. Same when I was on my electric skateboard, same when I was flying, I fly experimental planes, men my age, older, but no women. I started to wonder, like, I'm, I'm approaching 60. Is there something that I don't know? And uh, am I supposed to pull back? And so this book is actually a quest to answer, you know, should I keep outdoor adventure in my life? And I started to get very interested in what you're talking about, the messaging that women get as we age. And it became clear. And of course, I'm, in a, I'm a woman in America. The messaging is, is, has been clear for a little while. And by the way, there's a lot of science in this book. There's a lot of um, research, but I do not try to like back this up. Every woman I know when I say the toxic messaging we get, they, just, they nod, we all know. Because I've read a lot of books, they go in deep into why and what it is. And I just... I don't because it's depressing. It's simply true. So we get toxic messaging and that messaging is basically telling us that our bones are getting frail, that we're on a cognitive decline, that we should be narrowing our life, that we're no longer fun anyway. We're pretty culturally irrelevant. You know, you'll hear a lot of women say they feel invisible after a certain age. And, and that, and, and that's, I had a feeling that that was one of the reasons why women out, weren't out there in you know, cold water in on a skateboard, these limiting messages. And that really started me on this book. And the science is kind of crazy on this. And I, I know you know it. I don't know if it took you aback as much as it took me aback. But when I came upon the research that said, the way you look at your own aging predicts how well you age, which basically means if you have a negative view of your own aging, you have a cardiac you have a higher chance of a cardiac event earlier and cognitive decline earlier. And the opposite's true. If you have a really uh, optimistic, exploratory, exhilarated view of your future, then, and you're, what you can do as you age, then you are happier, healthier, and you live seven and a half years longer, which was huge. And then once I saw that science, I was like, wow, this is big. And thank you scientists for telling us this, but how do women in this country, at least, get uh, that positive view on their own aging when the messaging is so intense and subliminal? And I had a feeling that the answer was in getting outside and finding an activity. And, you know, it, the, the reason became clear slowly, but I'm just going to say it now, but it kept coming up. The reason is because when we step outside, what nature asks of us is a direct rebuke to all this messaging without even trying. When you go outside and let's say boogie board in the cold Pacific, you don't feel frail. You don't feel cognitively deficient. You certainly don't feel, you know, boring. And I went and I visited and I, I went boogie boarding with women who were doing this 60, 70, 80 in San Diego. And it was clear that 
they were upending their own expectations of themselves every time they got in the water and that that was really powerful. You know, it's interesting when I hear you talk about this, it reminds me of Catherine Switzer. Um, you know, in 1966, it was thought that a woman could not complete 26.2 miles. Because her ovaries would fall out. Oh, yeah, that's right. They said all of all of the female plumbing would just somehow crash through their vagina and they would die. Yeah. That, that was the thought pattern. No, I know. Yeah, it's true. Right. And the only reason I don't know if you know this part of the story, the only reason Catherine Switzer made it was because she had a boyfriend who was like this big bodybuilding looking dude who ran next to her. And every time they tried to chase her off the course, he would block for her. Did you know that? He had interference. Yeah, I've seen yeah. the video, I have the photos. I mean, and she also registered under like K.W. Switzer, whatever her middle name. She didn't put her middle right. name. Um, and they tried to pull her off <laughs> quite dramatically and yeah. they failed. And she beat a lot of people. She came in in the top third, I think. Oh, look, that that kind of thing happens all the time um, where people go, oh, women can't do this. They can't do that. Uh, I was an ultra cyclist for years, probably 25, 26 years worth of ultra cycling. And whenever someone new would come into the sport, they, oh yeah, yeah, I can beat the women. It's like, no, 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 no. I don't think you understand how this works. Women, you know, ultra cycling or any ultra sport is nothing but a pain fest and pain is, manif is manifested in your head and women can naturally handle way more pain than you can. So when things start to get tough, the woman's gonna kick your ass. That's just the way it works. Mm. Yeah, they might not have the power in the pedals that you do. They might not be able to climb the mountains as fast as you do. But when you're on a bike for 48 hours, they will creep and then kick your ass. So if you wanna be humbled, think you're gonna beat a woman and watch what happens. My older brother used to, um, drag race back in the 70s 80s all the way through the 90s and he said he never wanted to be in the finals up against a woman and i said why he said because they're just too cool men are there gripping going i, I have to win i have to win i have to win it's all about the takeoff in a drag race he goes a woman will just sit there as cool as a just a cucumber and just kick your ass he never wanted to be in the finals against a woman the fact that women can't beat men is just is bizarre. Don't you agree? I mean, yeah, well, I think we we don't know our potential yet because there's so much stacked against us in, still in terms of, or at least it's, I mean, maybe that's dramatic to say stacked against us, but there's just so much potential to be unleashed. I think in both men and women, it's obvious we keep breaking records. It's again, it's like your little brother. I mean, I think just the fact that records are broken sort of incrementally. They're not just, I mean, sometimes they're smashed, but basically um, we keep improving at this methodical pace, uh, pro partly based on expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you know, I, I see it all the time in sports. You know, my wife started doing ultra sports because she had no idea what it was but she was a runner and she was just getting to that marathon level. And she, after she sat in a car for 36 hours and watched my first race, she goes, my God, I just wish there was a running version of this. And I went, oh, wait a minute. That category is way bigger than, <laughs> than this category. And she got into it and, you know, just loved it. Right. So women don't know what they don't know. That's why I, I, I wanted to write this book because I did I do think that um, a template is really important inspiration. I have that in my own twin sister and I'm well aware of it. So I start the book with a base jumper, uh, Sean Brokeman, who is you know a grandmother, she's a kindergarten teacher, she's female, she's African American. she breaks every single stereotype you would think of someone who does the most one of the most dangerous sports in the world. And um, I didn't really, I myself, it was the one thing I did not do in this book because I do have a lot of experience with flying um, paraphernalia, but I really am also very accident prone. And I just thought, mm, I'm not going to do this. But I realized that just her standing and saying that she does it 
was something I needed in order to test my own, to see what I wanted to do. So a lot of these adventures are not necessarily things people would do themselves, but just to see that um, someone you would not expect does it just changes even in a tiny bit your understanding of the world. You bring up, um, you know, color a couple of times in the book when it comes all the to time. by the way, I bring it up all the time. Can yeah. I just say, because oh, absolutely. go on, yeah, I, I do this on purpose because I've noticed um, that many books by white writers uh, bring up, well, first two things. I want this book to be inclusive. So that means people of all colors, all abilities, all physical limitations, financial constraints and experience in the outdoors. Um, but, and so I, you'll notice that everybody is marked by their race and that's on purpose because I want people to understand that this is, I do not assume like a lot of people who, uh, write that all the characters are white until you say their race. So everybody is, is called out by their race because I want to show that all of us can can do it. You know, the outdoors has been unwelcome to people of color for far too long. You know, it started with, um, obviously, um, the Jim Crow laws that p parks weren't even desegregated till after I was born, which means right. that I have peers yeah. whose parents, Shushi, no, sorry, I have an old dog. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I want this to be in a very, very inclusive book because the outdoors is for everybody. Yeah, I'm glad you did that. You know, early on in this podcast, <clears throat> maybe in one of the first 50 episodes, which goes back about 11 years now, um, I had a guy on who was a triathlete, long distance, you know, full Ironman triathlete, and he was black. And my question was, it's the whitest sport in the world. How did you get in? I mean, what made you choose this? He goes, yeah, you know, I was, I was into cycling, you know, like everyone else, he was into one of the three sports, and then somehow meandered, you know, into yeah. triathlon. And I said to him, why do you think there's not more black people in triathlon? And his answer was compelling. He said, think about it basketball, you look at college, pro, the whole thing, full of black people, football, full of black people. That's what's in their neighborhood, right? There are hoops, there are football fields, they excel at those sports because it's available. He goes, the only black pools I saw were empty. There was no water in them. He goes, we don't learn how to swim. And I know from growing up, because I grew up in the deep south, half of my friends were black. And when the girls would come over to our, we had a swimming pool. When they came over to our swimming pool, they didn't want their hair to get wet because somehow chlorine and black people's hair just didn't mix. So there was this thing about black people not being good swimmers. And this guy talked about that. And of course I was called a racist because a black guy was on my podcast going, not enough black people learn how to swim. I think the same thing happens in the mountains because when I first started climbing, I saw zero black people. The only other race I saw, it seemed like, unless I was in Europe, and that came much later, was Asians. Asians seemed to be on the hiking trails around Colorado. I would see them in California, did extensive climbing in California. I, I would never see them rock climbing at all. I've never met a black person rock climbing. So when you were talking about this middle-aged black woman throwing herself off of, uh, El Cap, or was it Half Dome? I can't remember. Was it Half Dome? No, it was El Cap. El Cap. El Cap. Yeah. So she throws herself off, and, and you know, I'm thinking about this. It's like I'm not quite sure I've ever seen a black person out there. Well, see, this is the this is the myth, though. There's uh, there are a ton of people in the uh, of color in the outdoors, and we white people seem to like to perpetuate in some way this idea um that it's for white people only it's just not true i i think that you know because there's this legacy of sundown towns where you couldn't be uh non-white and be caught in certain towns after sunset um in none the not too distant past that's just people's parents so if my parents were of color 
I can't imagine the messages that they would give me about the outdoors. I totally understand it. And so now what we have is we have, so it's not that people don't want to be outside. It's that there was this real threat and still exists in white spaces. It's white spaces. But luckily, a lot of people of color have come together and they're making, um, they're coming together and forming groups of their own. Um, Black birders, uh, Black girls run, Black girls hike, Brown girls surf. I mean, it's, it's happening. And we should look, keep open your eyes because it's definitely there and it's amazing. And the outdoor industry is wising up and they're starting to, you know, sell their wares to, uh, but of course the people my age, so in, who are 60, they didn't grow, they grew up understanding rightly that the outdoors was um, a dangerous place if you weren't white. And uh, so now hopefully there's, because the outdoors is so medicinal for all of us. Yeah. And because there are people of all stripes out there, I just want you to find um, the, the, the activity that helps and the tribe that will, um, you know, best support you through that. I would like to think it's changing. I, I look at my own daughter, my stepdaughter, who's 27 now. Jesus Christ. How did that happen? Um, and they don't seem to notice color, right? They're the first generation where color doesn't seem to be as much of a problem. I don't know. You, uh, you still think you don't think it's coming around at all. I mean, it's a we're human, man. We just we just try to find ways to ostracize people, and color is one of them. It's a complicated issue. Can we get back to the outdoors, Vinny? Let's yeah. just do outdoors because yeah, no, that's, I, that's, I as a white person, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel. I don't even feel uh, educated enough. What I did know is that everybody sh- should get outside and it's powerful for all of us. And there are great role models out there. It's like when I was interested in wingsuiting and I couldn't find, I thought, oh, no women wingsuit. Well, it turns out there's tons of women who wingsuit. It's simply that they don't promote themselves the same way and they are not promoted the same way. So a lot of it is just um, sort of a cultural blindness because we want to keep these myths alive. But uh, I really wanted people of all also background, uh, excuse me, um, outdoor backgrounds to get outside. And so it isn't just, you know, uh, Louise Holy, who I interviewed, who's 80 and I went scuba diving with, who had a long career outside. Uh, But I, you know, go... Um, I talked to Vijaya Srivastava who learns to swim at a later age and she had no, no outdoor background and it became a powerful medium through which to live her sixties, seventies, and soon her eighties. You talk a lot of, you, you talk about, you know, wingsuits, uh, you do parasail from, I, I might be using paragliding, it wrong. Paragliding. Paragliding yeah. with the, the sailing parag- thing in Mexico. Right. Paragliding is like, paragliding. there's no rope and no boat. Um, and, you know, whenever I, I was in Chamonix climbing uh, Mont Blanc and you see all these people just all, all the time, right? Just hanging on these clouds and I'm looking at it going, and you would watch them take off, right? I would get nervous when they took off. It's like, what if that thing caves in? What if it just doesn't work the way they want to? What if they crash it? I'm sitting there going, what if, what if, what if? And then you get into these experimental planes. I have a friend who builds these canard wing planes, um, the kind that John Dimmer died in, um, Easy Ups. I can't remember what they call them, the actual name. But I've been in these planes as a passenger. You're flying these. How did this come about? Um, I, you know, I honestly, one of the few role models I had growing up was Amelia Earhart. It was the only, I read National Geographic avidly because we all got them sent to our homes and then my parents would save them. They'd be lined up all those yellow spines in the bookshelf. And I had a lot of male adventurers like Dave Brashears. I was reading about him and also uh, the guy that rode the, the red tomato across the Atlantic and the Pacific. Anyway, there, I had a lot of adventurers. I loved to follow them and I wanted to be an adventurer, but I didn't read about any women until, of, but of course, Amelia Earhart is the one thing that girls are given. We are, we're all given as we grow up. And so it was no coincidence that I learned to fly at a very young age. I was 20 when I learned to fly. I learned to fly Cessnas and I didn't love Cessna. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. There was no uh, fancy um, 
you know, uh, avionics like there are now. And, uh, I, and I also found, I, but I did find that, um, flying Cessna was a little boring for me. It was just kind of like being a car in the air. So I went to aircraft that was more like flying like a bird. So I've flown paragliders for decades. I flew paragliders and then I uh, flew hang gliders with motors. So again, it's all open cockpit as bare minimum as possible with my, my first uh, hang glider with a motor, also known as a trike, all I had was a wind speed in- indicator. That was it. I, I think okay. I had to, I had to start the motor. Like it was a lawnmower motor, pull on a string. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and then now I fly gyrocopters. So yeah. Cause it's the more like an adventure. Is, that's the scariest thing in the world, right? I mean, can you reverse those, those rotors if the engine stops and land it the way they do that? Or how does that work? <laughs> Who knows? It's all a miracle. Honestly, flying does seem like a miracle to me sometimes. I'm like, You're the craziest woman on the planet. Who yeah, knows? Like, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm airborne. And, you know, the truth is there is some discussion about the actual physics of becoming airborne. Like they're not, ex- I, you're going to get a lot of calls on this, I bet. But there is actual discussion about what really makes us airborne as if they kind of don't really know. <laughs> they right. know enough to design things, but there is a little bit of gray area. Okay, you can field all those calls when people come in like, no, they're not. They know it's Bernoulli. No, they know it's blah, blah, blah. The other one, I can't remember now. Well, I remember a guy wanted me to maybe break a record. He was going to build this aircraft. Uh, he wanted to do a helicopter where it, you know, you just pedal it with a bike. And since I'm a strong cyclist and I'm an endurance cyclist, oh, wow. he wanted me to oh, pedal you know, this thing. But there, to get the record, there was something to do with ground effect. Like you had to be so many feet off the ground, which means you're now airborne and you don't have the effects of the wind pushing down onto the ground. Hmm. So you have to be like 12 feet in the air, some BS version of that to have the record. Oh, okay. Right? I don't know. I have no idea what you're talking about because I don't try for records anymore. Not you see, you said you don't know what I'm talking about, but it's something called ground effect. I know right. what ground effect is. I don't right. know you what you're the record. Right. Right. But I, I'm sitting there going, ground effect, wait. But you're right. It, we don't really know how any of that works, right? I mean, the air, you always think the air is under the wing, but it's the air that's going over the wing, right? <laughs> and you don't know. Depends. It depends. No, I know. I know. I know all the, I've heard, read all the arguments. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, I like I like the idea that it's a miracle when I get off the ground, as long as I'm going fast enough and the thing is the rotor spinning fast enough. No, I'm, I'm an experienced pilot. I've been flying since I was 20. So for 40 years, four I have certifications in four different aircraft, I think. Uh, yeah. So anyway, but uh, yeah, the, the least aircraft, the better for me. I um, thought paragliding was the purest, um, but it's, you know, it it. Uh, there's a lot of para waiting when you paraglide. You have to wait for the wind to be just right. So I yeah. went to a to a motor. Yeah, there were a lot of guys. They were trying to go off of one mountain and catch a um, what, what do you call it? A thermo? I don't know. They were talking. There's like once or twice a year, or maybe every other year, where you can make it from this one mountain and end up on the top of Mont Blanc, mm-hmm. and then come back down the opposite direction. But everything has to be right. And these yeah. guys just keep going up and up and up and they're able to get there. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm looking at this going, Jesus Christ. I mean, climbing wasn't broken. You can, you know, you can use your feet guys and get up there. Well, it's kind but, of beautiful because you're watching birds and you're, you're really intimately connected with what nature is doing. Cause you can't see air. You can only see the effects of air. So right. um, it's kind of this beautiful mystery and sort of deduction that you're, and, and a little bit of prayer that you're constantly negotiating with mother nature. It's, it's a great, great, beautiful sport. But it works and you're still here. Um, entry level, what does it cost to, to fly, to do any of this? You know, what is, you know, you have to take lessons. I'm not talking about to be a pilot. I'm talking about to pilot one of these different devices that you're talking about. What does it take? What do you have to learn? I mean, you have to, I honestly, I started flying ultralights uh, or experimentals when there was no need for, I mean, they didn't mandate that you had a certification. So I was a little, it was kind of the cowboy era. 
in the uh, late 1990s. And um, so I, I sort of sli- I got grandfathered in, but you know, you have to take tests, you have to pay, you have to pay an instructor. It's, it's definitely, um, you know, an expensive passion, but yeah. um, it's, you know, a hanger. I, I, I have a partner in my gyro. I share my hanger. Uh, we share costs and um, you know, there's ways to do it. I look at these young people on Instagram flying, uh, all these women, women of color flying. It's really great. They talk about how they do it. They hold down other jobs. They become instructors. They wow. make it happen because they love it. You've written other books. Uh, tough, tough, broad, incredible read. By the way, from the beginning, I, I felt your pain going into the park and you have this young woman saying, hey, wait, you don't have the right credentials to get in. And you had your friend, your woman of color, getting ready to do something illegal on the other end of the park. So you did the only thing you could do. You have one of those, I call them the big wheel. Uh, you know, what do you call that that device? Right, it's the so one wheel, wheel, one wheel, yeah. one wheel. Like a skateboard, it's an electric skateboard, uh, but it's kind of more um, for four wheel drive. It goes on tra- single track and- So you can bounce around on that thing. Mm-hmm. You're right, 60 year old woman on a one wheel going through Yosemite just doesn't seem normal or right. And you even talked about that. You said, I got certain looks, people were staring at me and this sort of thing. Talk about that and talk about why someone like you would be on a one wheel and and doing that sort of thing and trying to help someone who wants to do something illegal, which I'm totally for, by the way. So the illegal part, okay, yeah. I mean, there are some people who've been really upset about base jumping and uh, we don't have to get into it. It it is illegal. Uh, It's only legal in one place in the United States. Uh, Be that as it may, I was on my way to interview her because I was really intrigued by base jumping as a pilot myself of various things. And uh, I got to the gate and the young, very young ranger said, you can't come in because we have a reservation system and it's not your name on the reservation. This is my very first interview for Tough Broad. So I was really nervous. And I said, and I re- remembered that I had my one wheel, this electric skateboard in the back. And I asked her, well, if I can't take my car in, can I ride my one wheel down into the valley? It's nine miles. And she was just, <laughs> there was, I mean, it was, <sighs> she took in what she was looking at, which was basically uh, she knew my age. She'd seen my um, my ID. I was 57. She saw my, you know, Prius. She saw the gray hair. She saw the cat dander coming off my shirt. And she <laughs> she was like, I can't compute that this woman want is going to get on a skateboard. It just was against right. sort of all the messaging and myths that she had um, that she and stereotypes she had been told. And and yet that's the way I managed to get into the park on my skateboard, which was kind of glorious. Really, it's a great way to. Um, nine miles of downhill on your skateboard is super fun. But it, it really showed me, I start off the book like that because it showed me just um, how uh, deep the messaging is about what we can and cannot do as we age. And it was, a, it's a very benign, it was congenial. I didn't, I didn't begrudge her at all. I was the same way when I was young, looking at older right. people like, what, you can't do that. Hey, that's my purview. Uh, and so I didn't begrudge her at all. And it was funny and and fun it's kind of fun to upend other people's uh expectations of you and i i ended up getting into the park and being ground crew for my my new friend uh sean and uh yeah so and the book really goes from there it is a funny book it is about these um it's really about the science so Nothing else is illegal in the book, may it, may it just be said. It's like I have something illegal in all my books. When I wrote Gutsy Girl, I wrote write about climbing the Golden Gate Bridge myself, which yeah. is illegal. I was not allowed to do that. Um, I had a bit, little bit of a fight with my publisher about it. And I told her, I told my publisher, look, they said, oh, we can't, you know, this is a book for 12-year-old girls or eight-year-old, eight to nine, 10, 11, 12-year-old girls. We can't write about something illegal. And I said, okay, look. You're going to allow a book where the main character takes a bow and arrow and keeps shooting all uh, her opponents in some game, and you sell that to 10-year-olds, and you're telling me that I can't write a story about climbing the Golden Gate Bridge where I tell them not to do it, but I'm imparting all these lessons about bravery and about um, you know adventure. So yeah, it's illegal, um, but I think that Sean is such an inspiration, what she does, and she's so skilled. And the chances um, 
Honestly, if there was a rescue for a base jumper, it's a lot easier to rescue a base jumper than it is a climber. And a climber is that's legal. And people were like, no, you're endangering rescuers. I've been a first responder myself. I'm a rescuer myself. And I would say that when you rescue a base jumper, what you're doing is you're scraping their body off the valley floor. It's not an endangerment to yourself. I promise. You've written several books. I've only read one. And you're one. You know, look, I know the book was not aimed at me. It wasn't aimed at white 61 year old Vinny. But I was inspired. You know, it makes me wonder what's next. Right. Well, you know, Vinny, I got to tell you that it actually was the only reason I make this for women, you know, is because the messaging is so intense for us and because I did not see women out there. And so it's a call for them to come out right. and join us out there. But it is for men. And I've gotten uh, a lot of men have gotten in touch with me because everything else about how important it is that, that we stay in nature and stay active in nature is completely uh, you know, transmissible to, to men too. I mean, nature itself, getting outside and exercising is way better than doing it in a gym, simply from all the medicinal effects of being outside in nature, from the, uh, the way that the wind uh, or bird song calms our brain waves. And therefore, you know, they've done so many studies on people who go out walking in a park and come back and take cognitive tests. And they test so much better on cognitive and memory because they've rested their brain in ways that allows their brain to, to, to it's like any athlete to optimize and, you know, regain strength. And so, you know, with the messaging aside, and I know you get messaging about your own aging, I just don't know what it is. And so that's why this is called tough broad, but this is for tough dudes too, I promise. Yeah, look, our my podcast has, you know, every every metric we look at is 51% women, 49% men. So we're right down the middle as far as my audience. But I'm telling you guys, go read go read this book. You will not be disappointed. It reminded me to to go out there and to keep doing it. You know, my wife likes to laugh about this and we laugh, you know, she whenever we we're at a dinner party, she makes sure that it comes up. I said to her one day, I said, you know what, I think I'm gonna take a tent and just go live in the backyard for a couple of days. And she was like, well, what are you talking about? I said, I'm just gonna go live in the backyard. And she goes, what about the bathroom? I'll come inside and use the bathroom. And then I'll go right back out. What about your food? I'll have it in a nice chest. What about eating? I have at least two Coleman stoves that I know of, if not three or I can build a fire, I can do whatever I want, but I want to go live in the yard for two or three days. And she couldn't wrap her mind around it. I said, honey, think of it this way. I spend thousands of dollars, because I live in Virginia now, I spend thousands of dollars to go to California, or to Flagstaff, or to fill in the blank, Europe, to go live in a tent. Why can't I do it where it's almost free? And she goes, but you can walk in the house and say, yes, but I'm not. I'm going to live in the backyard. Why do you have to be a thousand miles from your house before you, you camp out? Why can't you just go outside and camp out in your backyard and make that a thing and convene with that nature and not have this thing? I'm holding a phone up because most of you don't watch me on YouTube. Not having a phone in your hand and not having a television turned on or a radio or anything else, just living, just being there listening to the birds, watching what's going on, and being outside. What say you? Well, I mean, I actually, a friend of mine told me this a long time ago, I was going all over the world to have adventures, um, kind of tagging along on all as many, with as many people as would have me. So I, you know, sea kayaked through Belize and Alaska, well, Alaska's our country, but it's still far away, and uh, mountain bike through China and Vietnam. Bottom line is my friend Lars Holbeck, uh, who was this amazing adventure kayaker, and we paraglided together. He told me, Caroline, you know, the best wilderness is here in the United States. Why are you going so far? And then as I get older, I realize I don't even have to go that far. I don't even have to go to another state. Really? That's, that's okay. Okay. I don't usually, even. Usually it's my dog. So. <laughs> Sorry. Please. 
Have at it. No, that's okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll move her if she gets too loud. But anyway, so what I found, and as I get older, I go on many micro adventures because they are as satisfying to me now as a as 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 any adventure that that took me far away. And it, we have all the elements because what I learned really through this book. I mean, when I started, I knew that outdoor adventure was good for me, and I liked who I was in the outdoors and the tests that I would go through and the things I would think and the way I would feel physically. Uh, but I, I really wanted to get everybody outside. So I do make con- what I thought initially were concessions on what this uh, definition of adventure was. Okay. I, I went walking with a 93 year old. I went bird watching and that was initially a concession. Like I want everyone to get outside and I know not everyone has the same high octane definition, but what I ended up realizing is no, Birdwatching is an adventure. It has all the rhythms of an adventure where you're on a quest, you feel exhilaration. There's um, the anticipation when you hear you know, a bird, but you don't see it, then you see it. There's the physical vitality of simply being outside. And in the chapter that I talk about, I'm actually with a woman who is in a wheelchair because I was interested in how we adapt as we age our yeah. adventures. So uh, this was a physical adaptation, but of course we add to adapt mentally too. I don't need to go far to feel this rhythm of adventure, exhilaration, exploration, and pushing my own comfort zones. I was learning new things. I'd never been bird watching. And we were, um, we went six miles. It was a -a bird-a-thon. So what I realized is that, yeah, you can go in your backyard and have an adventure (laughs) too. Yeah. You know, this past weekend, this past week, I was back in Louisiana. My mom had to have um, lung surgery. A woman never smoked a day in her life. She had a, a mass on her lung, and she's mm-hmm. mid to late 80s, and you know, I was worried we would lose her. So I got in my car, drove home. Turns out my mom goes through the surgery. She's fine. Now I'm there for a whole week, and uh, I need to find things to do. And my younger brother has a house out in the swamp, they, they call them camps out in the swamp, and they go out there to go fishing and what have you. So he goes, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I haven't been in the swamp in years. And I feel like I left the swamp behind when I left home to go to California. So we went out there and he's got a couple of these, they call them jet skis. But the last time I jet skied, it was a jet ski. Right now, it's like a bike you sit on, you know, oh, okay. so like a you know, pass. You know, it's like a water thing. You sit on the thing and, you know, it's got this powerful engine on it and it's got a jet motor and the whole thing. He's got a couple of these at his camp. And he goes, uh, you want to go out on the jet skis? And I was like, eh, last time I rode one, it was kind of boring, you know, but he goes, ah, let's just go for a spin. We start going through the swamp. And the great thing about these motorized jets is you can get right in close. You could get in. A bit, right? The water can be a couple of feet deep. You don't have to be out in the middle, you know, because there's a, a big transom in the water. And um, I saw an alligator. And I hadn't seen an alligator probably in two or three years, maybe four years. And then I just became obsessed with finding more and more alligators. Probably saw five or six throughout the whole day. Not that many, because it was midday. They come out in the evening. But then I started seeing eagles. And you start seeing all of this nature, you see everything around you, right? And there it is. But most people never do that. They never, they live right there, right near the swamp, and they never get out there to go see what's in the swamp. You know? Well, you know, the cool thing about being older is that we are more in the present moment. And let me just speak for myself. I'm more in the present moment. I don't have that baggage of youth it makes everything so much more enjoyable. And one thing I learned on this journey of writing this book was the concept of awe. And I had, I found it, of course, when I went wing walking, I interviewed a woman named Cynthia Hicks, who was 71 and she had had cancer, had to, a lot of her outdoor activities had to kind of um, not drop away or, 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 or change. So she gave up mountain biking for road biking, for instance, but she was so, um, 
grateful about everything. Like, oh, I loved scuba diving, but I can't do it anymore because of the chemo. I'm so grateful I had that many years. And then she'd find something else. And one of the things she found was wing walking. <laughs> wing walking is what it sounds like. It's, it's getting up on the, the top of the wing when the plane is flying. And I didn't really want to do it because um, I'm a pilot and obviously getting out of a cockpit is, feels dumb. But I was interested in how one-time activity might uh, activate our neural system as we age or change our sense of ourselves, like maybe when you jump out of a plane, how you can do that. Uh, so as a skydiver, a one-time skydiver. So I did this and I took the class. There's only one place in the United States where you can do this. And I slithered on, it's not walking, it's it's wing slithering, wing praying. <laughs> then you attach yourself to a king post and the pilot begins doing loops, barrel rolls and hammer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I became like instantaneously, I went from being a surly wing walker to like the most ecstatic person ever. And when I got on the ground, I was curious, like I understand adrenaline very well, having experienced all my life. And I, I, this was more than that. And I found out through research that what I had experienced was awe. And it's crazy that I'd never come across this before, but it's, it's now exploded since the books come out. There's other books that have been out about it. And, um, but awe is basically that feeling you get in the presence of something bigger than you. It's like fear, wonder, dread. It turns out it's really, really good for you. And it's really important. And going outside is a surefire awe trigger. So what you were doing looking for, for, for alligators was right. like this awe experience. You were being very present and you were being um, looking <laughs> with wonder for something that would, and you then you were electrified by it. So it turns out you don't have to wing walk in order to feel awe. Um, you can just walk because they did studies here in San Francisco with people between the ages of 60 and 80. And they basically just said, go on a 15 minute walk for the next eight weeks, you know, once a week, I think it was. And, but when you're out there, look at everything with fresh childlike eyes. That was the instruction. So what they were trying to do was cultivate awe in people. And then they measured their, met, their metrics, their health metrics after that. And they found that their inflammation markers were markedly lower. So inflammation is obviously your audience knows this is a sign of ill health. Absolutely. And then the all walkers self-described as feeling way less anxiety, way less depression, and more gratitude and compassion, which was kind of amazing. And the scientists call awe, and I want to read this quote because it's pretty great, um, and I can't do it justice myself. They call awe a reset button for the brain. Um, and how do I find it? Um, uh, Sorry, you can cut this out of your... Oh, we're live. Oh, no, 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 we're good. Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, here we go, here we go. Got it now. Okay, she says, uh, the Annie Murphy Paul wrote a book called Extended Mind. I highly recommend it to people. She has a chapter on this kind of awe. Of Hang awe. on, the extended mind. Yep. Hang on. Annie Hang Murphy on. Paul, no relation to me, sadly. Uh, she says that when we are awestruck, quote, we become more curious and open-minded and we become more willing to update the templates we use to understand ourselves in the world. So uh, we become more creative and we sort of get out of our autopilot selves. And the thing is, uh, Vinny, we live in a world of anti-aw devices. You know, our phone is an anti-aw device because it right. narrows our vision. It makes us feel powerful and in control, which we're not. And that's the opposite of awe. And it's, that's not good for us. Uh, so, oh, and oh, the cool thing about this all walk study they did is that almost as an afterthought, they said, hey, could you guys take selfies too? Um, and oh, by the way, they had a control group too of all of walkers who were not instructed to uh, cultivate awe, who just walked like we usually do. And they, they did not, um, they did not report these, these changes like the awe walkers did. So the other thing was they everybody had to take selfies and the selfies of the all walkers started out normally like the face in the middle. And then as the walks progressed, the face got smaller and the background got bigger. Oh, wow. And it was like this metaphor for awe itself. It was like a sense of who you are really in the outer in relation to the outer world. They call it a small self perspective. It's like a healthy understanding of yeah, you, who you are in proportion to everything else. And that's why you feel more interconnected because you're not just like the center of everything. You know, awe allows you, allows this space for mystery and wonder. And um, 
Yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, everybody should cultivate awe, which is what you were doing. That's why it turned out. OK, so I went wing walking about halfway through the book. I realized right. that I had been cultivating awe with people who were cultivating awe. So when I went on my walk with 93 year old Dot Fisher Smith and I went with her because I was interested in movement, like, oh, we could all walk. Most of us can walk. So at least let's do this. Let's look at walking. And that that's when I came away with a really much deeper understanding of yes, walking's good, but walking in nature is really important. And then I enumerate all the medicinal effects. But the other thing Dot did was uh, she would stop and look at leaves, at flowers. She'd point at the heron's nest. Um, she'd spout poetry, you know, based on whatever she was suddenly moved. I mean, we had we were going on an all walk, and I didn't realize it. And same when I went bird watching with Virginia Rose. Bird watchers are the most capable of all than I've ever seen. <laughs> They're amazing uh, that way. So be that uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that I get awe now from my gyro. When I fly my gyro, I'm I I cultivate awe. I look at things, and of course, it's easy because I am you know. 500 feet off the deck and looking at the ocean. And that's kind of awe-inspiring, but you can do it while walking or looking for alligators. Have you ever heard of Colin O'Brady? No. You should try to get his book. Okay. And read it. It's called The 12 Hour Walk. Mm. Colin is a guy who walked across the North Pole. Mm -hmm. And it was back a few years ago, these two guys were trying to see who could get there the fastest. <laughs> and they weren't together. Mm -hmm. They were they were both in their own expedition. But Colin was trying to talk to the other guy from Europe somewhere. And the guy said on like the third or fourth day, I want to be left alone. So they just started going back and forth. And, you know, you know, outside magazine, everybody was covering it. And guys like me who are just stuck on that kind of thing are watching it every day. Oh, I love it, too. What year was this? Because I'm surprised I didn't follow that. Just a couple of, just a couple of years ago. Oh, OK. Uh -huh. And after after he finished, he wrote this book called The 12 Hour Walk. <clears throat> and what he was trying to encourage people to do, I had him on a podcast and he goes, yeah, I didn't get to read the book before the you know most of the time i don't get to read the book before because the, the publicist goes can you have them on right now today yes i'll mm -hmm. do it and i'll go back and he said yeah he goes when was the last time you just walked out of your house and just started walking and i was like well, i do it every day I take my dog out we go for about an hour sometimes i break into a jog you know, and this kind of thing, you know, my dog wants to chase a few squirrels, I let him off the lead and he comes back and we, we do our thing. And he goes, No, no. He goes, Do you listen to music or podcasts? Goes, oh, yeah, I, I, I book audio books. I tried to get your book on audio. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be reading your it's other gonna book. It's going to be on audio soon. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to it again on audio. And I'm going to get your other books because I'm fascinated with your writing, you as a writer. I'm gushing right now because you are what writers are supposed to be. You tell the story, you put a lot of color in it, and it's great. I don't mean the women of color. I mean, your writing is colorful. And, and, you sh and, and I can't wait for your next book to come out, Caroline. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I really mean that. But this 12-hour walk, he said, yeah, I was walking in silence every day, and I realized that your perspective changes when you're just walking in silence. So he's encouraging people to do a 12 hour walk. So what I did was what I always do. What's the 12 hour part though? Didn't he walk for like 12 million days? Well, he walked for 12 hours a day and then he oh. had the tent and the whole thing and the whole oh. thing. And I think towards the end, he, he got on satellite, he got his wife or girlfriend on satellite and she was like, you're not going to break the record. You got to, you have to increase it to like, 14 or 15 hours a day. So he had to even walk more. So I woke up the next morning and started walking. It happened to be a Saturday. He said, create your own rules. So I created rules. Rule number one, no cell phone. It was turned off and it was in my little tiny backpack that had this bottle in it that had water in it. That's it, a 40 ounce bottle of water. And I put some electrolytes in it and I took off. Rule number two, 
I wasn't going to talk to anyone or utter one word the entire time. Mm -hmm. Rule number three, I wasn't going to sit down. Mm -hmm. So I had to walk for 12 hours, or if I stopped at a light or whatever, I wasn't going to jog in place. You know, I didn't want to get arrested. So I just walked for 12 hours. And the things that occurred during that walk, it's just unbelievable. It, it was the most magical thing. And when people go, oh, come on, tell me. I was like, no, no, no. I thought about people, places, things. I saw things you never see when you, I barely know Charlottesville. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia now. I moved here right before COVID. I didn't know my own town. I learned about my town. I walked probably close to 40 miles that day, right? And just walked. And it was the most liberating thing I've ever done. That's when I came up with the idea of camping in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? You should try it, Caroline. You should go out tomorrow morning and just start walking. So it's interesting. I did some research because I was interested in, in the brain, obviously, because that's one thing that we are concerned about as we age. So uh, I cover novelty. Um, and that's why how I learned to fly a gyrocopter, because I... Um, thought that I would try to learn something new. And of course, the brain, as we know, if we've looked into the science, but I think society kind of gives you the sense that, oh, you, you're too old, you can't learn something new. I mean, that's a lot of people say, I'm too old, old dog, new tricks, can't be done kind of thing. And it's just not true. Our brain is constantly growing, we're constantly laying down new neural pathways. And the key is to, is to stimulate it. And so I was looking into uh, brain health. And one of the things they talk about is how um, movement and thinking is how you can optimize your creativity. There's been a lot of studies. This is why Einstein walked, a lot of painters walk, a lot of artists walk, uh, because it, stim it somehow, in other words, the researchers say, look, we do not think like a computer. We think better when we're thinking with our hands or our feet as well. So I went orienteering with somebody. Uh, orienteering is a very obscure sport. The reason I did it was not because of this walking and movement thing. I kind of, so to speak, stumbled on it after I was, when I was writing the chapter, I was interested in orienteering because I was interested in memory. And it turns out um, that memory and navigation are linked in our brain. And if we lose navigation, then we can lose memory. And conversely, when we increase our navigational skills, we increase our memory. Memory is, is all in the hippocampus area and they, they have a test for London taxi drivers. They have to learn like 25,000 streets and thousands yeah. of landmarks in order to become a London taxi driver, even today. And what they saw is that the taxi drivers who have been driving the longest had the biggest hippocampus, which means that we can actually improve our memory. We just have to, one of the ways is to navigate. And unfortunately with GPS, we aren't navigating. We don't know where we are spatially. I myself am uh, uh, very rarely oriented to the cardinal points and I'm constantly trying to do that. But anyway, this is, you know, th I got very interested in the brain and how it works. And, and again, one of the reasons, one of the good ways. So orienteering turns out is basically uh, when you race through a, a landscape and you have to stop at all these checkpoints and you have to navigate yourself using a, a map and compass and, um, Penny DeMoss, who was 72, she's the one that took me orienteering. She said, basically, orienteering is running and thinking. And yeah. I, I was really impressed by it. And I think that it should be um, prescribed by doctors because, you know, as we get older and, and start, our memory starts to become a little weaker, we need to trigger it by, and they've shown, um, they had a study where they had older people do navigation via VR and then take cognitive tests, and they did uh, way better on the memory tests because of that. And, and you know, I, I just as a quick aside, probably a lot of people know this, but there's the way memory champions often remember, like, let's say, long series of numbers of pi, which is a classic, um, I think, thing that people do to show off their memory. It, they, they construct what they call a, a, a basically a place in their mind they call it a memory palace, but it's like, let's say your old childhood home, they put it in their mind and then they, they um, walk through that house in their mind and they place numbers of pi in this particular places. Like I'll put four at the, on the windowsill and then I'll turn right and there'll be a six. And that's how they remember 
tons of numbers by navigating through a house. Wow. Now, I when I first heard this method, it's called the method of loci, and it's been known for centuries that this is a really good way to remember things. When I first heard it, I thought, why are you trying to remember a house and a series of numbers? That seemed like that would, you know, overload your brain. But in fact, because navigation and memory is in the hippocampus, or both in the hippocampus, it actually helps you to navigate through a memory. Yeah, you know, I've had experts on this show talk about memory so many times. You know, I still use a compass, right? And most people today have no idea how to use a compass. Everything is either, as you said, in the phone, in the car, you know, you, you hit the nav and you rock and roll. Most people don't know how to use a compass or even what it is, right? Which is kind of scary. And when you think about it, I'm going to ask you a question. I want to see if you can answer it right away. You can leave one number off so that no one will figure it out. Do you remember your childhood phone number? Yes, I do. Yeah, right. Three, six, seven, eight, nine, six. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. And yeah, no, I know. It's it's bonkers. I don't remember anybody's phone number these days. So No one does. We, the average person our age, we had at least 30 numbers in our head. Mm -hmm. I wanted to call my buddy Todd if I wanted to go call Allison, if I wanted to call, didn't matter who I went, number was right on the tip of your tongue and you yeah. just dialed it, right? Well, now we've outsourced it all and it's going to be, a, it's kind of going to be, a, I think it's going to be a problem. When I was writing the book, there wasn't a lot of research on GPS, um, but there was some. And of course, once you know this, you know that this is going to start being a real issue. So I hope, I hope that people will get on that. And, uh, you know, I tried to use it. I went, I write about it in the book. I went back to paper maps just because of this. I myself, like I said, I'm worried about my memory. It's fine now, but, uh, but I definitely am never uh, oriented well. And so I'm, I'm often getting lost. I know this about myself. So I tried to use paper maps in order to improve that. And it's, it was, I mean, just handling a paper map just physically is very difficult huge and you have yeah. to, you know, karate chop it in all the right ways to get it to the manageable. It was just, it turned out to be a more dangerous to do while driving, but I, but there's other ways to use a map that, um, you know, maybe before you leave or when you go camping, bring a paper, you, you should bring a paper map anyway. It goes without saying, but yeah. anyway, that's, uh, and it's very, really quite fascinating what the brain needs. The other thing it needs is novelty. So, you know, learning something new again, as we age is really important. And so few people do that, except for, you know, like I say in the book, how to stand six feet apart because there's a pandemic. A lot of people, when I ask, like, have you, when was the last time you learned something new? They'd say, yeah, nah. Mm -mm. So. I've, I've talked about this on a podcast. <clears throat> a few years ago, I was on my spinner, which is right now. I'm in my gym. All of this happens in my gym. I was on my spinner watching a, a movie from the 80s with Rob Lowe, and he was driving a, a Porsche 911. And I said, you know, I always wanted one of those. And I'm going to find myself a Porsche 911. I'm going to buy it. And I have this whole thing in my head, I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to do all this stuff. And for two days, I became obsessed with finding a convertible Porsche 911. And I found one. And I was going to call the guy and purchase it. And then I started thinking to myself, I, I got this, I, I broke out into a cold sweat. I went, Wait a minute, what, what are you doing? You're not a Porsche guy. You buy a Porsche, what's next? Country club? What, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Do you really want a Porsche? And the answer was no. No, no possession has ever made me happy. I cannot think of one possession that's made me happy for any amount of time. And here I am getting ready to buy the ultimate in possessions, right? The thing that everyone thinks they want in their life. So then I sat around for the next day or so and I said, what do I really want to do? Like, what, what, I, And it was like that. It was learning. So I want to learn something. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to build a kayak. I'm a kayaker. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I've always wanted to build a wooden kayak. You see these beautiful kayaks, you know, guillemot kayaks and all this says, oh my God, I'm going to build one of those. And uh, instead of buying a Porsche, I built the kayak. It took exactly 320 hours. I learned how to work with wood. I worked with this guy, Joey Schott at Turning Point Boatworks, who happens to be, I want to say the penultimate 
kayak builder right behind the guy over at Guillemot. This guy. Right behind the guy who wrote Starship in the Canoe. Best book ever. Have you read that? No. no oh my no. God. You got to read that book. Oh, sure. Hang on. It's. Um, You're giving me a lot of reading. And I was going to ask you book. of your book to read next. No, that, that book is about. Um, Sea kay- he kind of brought sea kayaking to, if I remember this correctly, to the to the United States because he put his mind to building a canoe like the Eskimos had, and he taught himself how to roll it. And he lived in Alaska, and um, his he was a, a a Dyson. He was Dyson's son. Uh, you know, oh, really? Esther Dyson's brother, George. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think he was. I think I can't, his was his name George. Anyway, that that book is so good. He's um, obviously, sorry if you're listening, Mr. Dyson, but he was kind of a lost soul and he just went off on his own and learned how to build this kayak and writes. So the starship is his father and the canoe is him. Because his father is a famous astronomer, astrono- astrophysicist. That whole family is kind of amazing. I'm, I'm always impressed. You know, I use Dyson as my hero because I've started several companies and it's, a lot of times it's based on the way he works. Oh, well, then you must read this book. Oh, I have Are to read it. I guess. Yeah, because this is the sun. Yeah. So I, I built this thing, right? And it's in my garage. And I take it out. People, uh, my, my buddy who's Dave the Kayaker online, he calls it the Stradivarius of kayaks, <laughs> right? And, you know, people see it in the water. I can't believe you have that thing in the water. And it's like, I didn't build it to look at it. I built it to use it. Mm-hmm. The same thing with rowing. During the pandemic, I took up rowing. I know that you were a rower in college, correct? Mm-hmm. I took up rowing during the pandemic because my gym closed and all I had was a spinner and I didn't have the weight rack behind me. I ended up building a gym in my house because I didn't want to ever be without a gym again. Right? So I just built, I had it all built. But I bought this rowing machine from Concept 2. I didn't realize it, but Concept 2 keeps track. Every time you row, they they know you've been rowing. Oh. And they sent me a, they sent me a t shirt one day. And I was like, Oh, this is very nice of them. I made the million meter club. Oh, that's right. I didn't know. And then before I knew it, I had 5 million meters. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, wait a minute. <clears throat> I've been in my basement rowing for 5 million meters. Do you have any idea how many Hallmark movies you can watch in 5 million meters? A lot. Uh, lot. A lot. I took up rowing. Now I'm a rower, mm-hmm. right? These are things, and I'm 60. I took up rowing last summer. I turned 60 and I was rowing. Now I, I can't wait to get back on the water again this spring, right? Yeah. I mean, anytime you learn something new, you're kind of, you're not just learning that thing, but you're expanding your own sense of what you can do. And it you yeah. leads to other things. And, the, you know, it's, it's like what Lorraine Void, who was one of the boogie boarders, told me that once she was boogie boarding and she realized, oh, well, if I can get in this cold water and I can be tumbled around by these waves and I'm 62, what else can I do? And she started exploring yeah. other things. You, so what's next for you? What, what, what's next for Caroline? What, what are you going to do next? Uh, you walked on the wing of an airplane. That's what made me it. I saw that photo on Instagram and I went, I didn't know people still did this. I thought no, they, this they don't really, I mean, they don't, they, uh, yeah, it's, it's not that it's psycho. You know, I'm interested in the psychology of fear. It, it, you know, we had a rope attached to us actually that attached to the plane, but funnily enough, they never told us what would happen if we actually fell. And none of us asked the three of us who were taking the lesson. And, uh, and I just kept imagining like, am I going to be dangling under the plane if I fall and he's going to try to land it. But you know, they knew that really no one ever really falls because you're holding on to something the whole time. I mean, it's kind of almost yeah. impossible to fall. I think it's but just the wind was coming at you. How far, uh, that plane yeah, the is wind was, the wind. I don't know. Cynthia Hicks, who was 71, she made it like the wind was no big deal. And as I say in the book, it was almost like when I stood up and that wind hit me, I felt betrayed by Cynthia that <laughs> she had not told me this. And I thought, oh, I know what's going on. Like wing walking is like childbirth. You only remembered the gilded moments. You don't remember the pain because this wind was uh, unforgettable to me. So everything was like moving against molasses. But, you know, you make it work. I kept asking 
the um, instructor on the ground, Marilyn, Marilyn Mason, and she herself was, she was a wing walker. Like she didn't, she did it, but yeah. you know, otherwise there's no wing walkers, but this cause her husband had the plane and she was the wing walker. But um, she said, Oh, I said, but okay, we're learning the moves here. And it was just basically five moves. And we just did them over and over, and over again on the ground. And I said, but what about when they're where in the air? Like it's different at 3000 feet. And she goes, it's not really, it's just at 3000 feet. And don't worry, your muscle memory will take over. And she was right. It does take over uh, as long as you're, and it really, it was, a it, you, you train for something, um, you lock it into your neural system and it, it's true. It works. Well, I color me fascinated by you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, could go on, I could go on for another hour. I, I can't, I can't do that to you. I want to read you. You, you have several books. Um, mm -hmm. you, you have fighting fire. You have you are mighty gutsy girl lost cat. Uh, I read the, you know, just the, the, the little treatment online on lost cat. I'm thinking maybe that's my next Caroline. I, Paul. Re what, what I, I, recommend, I recommend lost cat. I, I love that book. I wrote it with my ex wife. She's amazing. She's the illustrator, and it's it's supposedly about lost cats, but it's a, a lot our lost cat. Uh, I wrote it after I had a really terrible accident. I uh, crashed my own um, ultralight. I mean, it was pilot error. There was there was extenuating circumstances, but ultimately, you know, you, the pilot takes. It was pilot error. It was yeah. dumb decisions that I made, and then I was injured and pretty much injured for a year. And anyway, the the book chronicles my craziness from injury, but through the, um, the fact that my cat disappeared. And then yeah. when he came back, I was like, where the hell have you been? And it's really about the, it's called lost cat, a true story of love, desperation, and GPS technology. And it's a very fast read. And it's really, it's illustrated by Wendy, who's a fantastic illustrator. And it's, it's basically about lost humans. And it, it probably take you an hour get a, to read or less. And well, uh, I think you'll laugh the whole way through. No, I'm, I'm in love with your writing and I love good writing. So it's going to be my next book. Um, but if then you want to access your inner nine year old boy or girl, then gutsy girl is uh, also a, a fun uh, or just give it to someone. It's, it's really, it's an entreaty for girls to get outside and yeah. learn bravery and have, because I think it builds confidence, but boys love that book because it's about my mishaps and misadventures of which sadly there are so many, but I survive and um, I learn lessons and I impart them. And, uh, and it's actually uh, kind of funny the whole time <laughs> as mishaps tend to be. I can't wait to get into it. Uh, but you know, Starship uh, in Canoe, Starship, Starship. New. yeah, that's that. I'm, I don't know how it's going to hold up. I think it was written in the '70s. Doesn't matter. You yeah, know, if it's, it's good. It's good. It's, I mean, knowing if you like Dyson, then yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of Dyson. The Extended Mind. I got to go look that up. You, you've given me a lot here today, Caroline. Um, well, you have too, Vinny. So thank you. Food for you. Got to hang with me because you have to stay on until after this all uploads or something. It might take a minute or two okay, after. No but. I was so fascinated by you. I forgot to run an ad that I was supposed to do in the middle of the show, but I'll do it now. <laughs> I run that. Can't you Paul, cut it in? No, no, I'm going to do it right I'll now. Is it, a beer is, ad? Huh? is it a beer ad? I'll do it. No, <laughs> I don't do beer ads. It's a health and fitness podcast. Oh, okay, sorry. But what we do talk about is uh, the best olive oil on the planet. Paul Capelli and Stephen Crutchfield, two wonderful men very much in love. They were married and they started Villa Capelli olive oil out in Italy. And uh, well, Paul passed away at some point. Guy was just a great guy all the way around. But Stephen Crutchfield kept the company going. They're the longest running sponsor of this show, Villa Capelli. Now listen, folks, you can go buy olive oil here in the United States and you might get lucky. You might get something that's good. But you probably won't because you're allowed to cut oil up to 40% with seed oils and still call it 100% pure olive oil. Now, there's some good oils out there, but they don't pay me to talk about them. Stephen Crutchfield does. 
So we're going to talk about Villa Capelli. I use it here. It's right out of Puglia, Italy. Get the three liter tent. Uh, listen, let's cheat. I'm going to teach you guys how to cheat. First off, if you put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, you're going to get 10% off. But wait, there's more. If you spend more than $125 after the discount, so you got to spend about $140 bucks minus the 10% discount, you'll be at $126, and you can get free shipping. Now, when you're shipping three liters of olive oil, that's a big savings. So that's two ways to save at Villa Capelli. Let them know we sent you promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E. Don't put a wimpy Y on there. You won't get your savings. There's some books you want to go read, but the one you want to read first is called Tough Broad by Caroline Paul. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. You guys will too. I'm certain of it. We talked about a lot of other books, but Lost Cat will be my next book. And once I read it, it'll be in the Vinny Book Club, so you guys can get that. The Gutsy Girl, I'll probably never read it because I can't imagine having that book in my hand and someone seeing The Gutsy Girl being read by a big rough. Maybe I could just put something over it. Get it that. on your Kindle. Get it on your iPad. Put yeah. a bag over it. Old school. Listen, I read your whole book on a phone. That's how impressive that book was. Oh. I read the PDF on my phone while I was taking care of my mom in the hospital. So, um, yeah, great book. Go check it out. Do, 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 do. You know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, go to VinnyTartarese.com. Click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire. gets my train down the track. And we're able to keep this show free for a million years in a row. You can rate and review this podcast. If you're a hater, don't rate and review. But if you really like the show, please go rate and review. We really appreciate that. Uh, on behalf of Caroline Paul, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with this guy talking about walking. Walking.